Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the fourth lecture in my series on ultrastructural pathology and description. We're going to continue our tour through the body and try to figure out if we can tell what organ system and what cell we are in based on the composition of the cell, the number of organelles, their location, maybe even take into account some of the extracellular neighbors. Let's start today in the respiratory system, a system in which a lot of electron micrographs have a lot of clear space because of the nature of this organ system. If we start in the trachea, you can see cross sections of three very prototypical epithelial cells. They are columnar to cuboidal. They have surface microvilli. These are the shorter of the two structures that compose a surface substructure of these particular cells. They don't have any particular obvious uh, things to characterize them. If we look at the longer cilia, the cilia when caught in cross section always have these stripes and those are the microtubulin uh, which composes the cilia and at the bottom of them you will see these dense aggregates which are the basal bodies which uh, anchor them into the apical cytoplasm and also are responsible for initiating the motion of the cilia. Like any prototypical cell you have a tight junction, a belt desmosome, some gap junctions at the top to make sure that these are bolted together. And these particular cells have a lot of mitochondria. You can imagine that to make the cilia wave back and forth, it's gonna take a lot of energy. And so that's why the mitochondria are pretty robust with thick cristine, and they're often clustered in large numbers underneath the cilia. I don't think that you're going to mistake ciliated epithelium for too many other things, but you will see cilia, and we'll see them later on in this lecture or the next lecture in the nervous system, and again in the reproductive system. As we move a little farther down the airway, we get to the, uh, uh, the rim of the alveolus you will start to see we still have a, a few ciliated cells down here. And then there are a number of cells which have microvilli but lack cilia. They're basally oriented uh, nuclei. And then if we could get a little closer, we would see that in and around these mitochondria, you would see large numbers of smooth endoplasmic reticulum profiles. These are what used to be known as club cells. We dropped that name because Max Club was a member of the National Socialist Party in Germany and did a lot of experiments on prisoners. Just terrible, terrible man. And so these are now called club cells. And we didn't even have to change the, uh, the CL on any of these cells. Now the reason that they have so much smooth endoplasmic reticulum is that these are the central lobular hepatocytes of the respiratory system. They will detoxify either inhaled substances or substances that reach the respiratory system through the bloodstream. So hopefully if there are any toxins, they will detoxify them, rendering them harmless. Unfortunately, uh, in certain cases, such as uh, 3-methylindole poisoning in cattle perillament, uh, for ipamine off of moldy sweet potatoes, they take a fairly innocuous metabolite and they will turn it into a toxic metabolite, which will cause death initially to these cells and then to the cells around them, ultimately resulting in uh, atypical interstitial pneumonia, formation of hyaline membranes, uh, etc., because those compounds are also very toxic to the pneumocytes. So these are the club cells. They often sort of protrude into the lumen and you may at the top find apical secretory granules. They usually have some pretty prominent uh, mitochondria to help power a number of metabolic processes within the, within the cell. And we always said that we wanted to, from time to time, throw a little degeneration in this is a club cell which was in a calf who was treated with 3-methylindole um, 
and 3-methylindole will circulate within the bloodstream, usually coming out of the rumen, and it is metabolized by the club cells to a toxic compound. And these are the first cells that actually get whacked. It's an overwhelming toxin, and we can see that there are some signs that we can associate with degeneration here. Um, looking at the top of the cell from the top down, you have loss of microvilli. So you have loss of the surface substructure. Remember that this is important when it comes to uh, <clears throat> the cytoskeleton. Not the earliest change, but a significant change in the later stages of reversible degeneration is disassembly of the cytoskeleton because so much of those microvilli are actin filaments. When they revert from filamentous to globular forms, those microvilli just sort of flatten out and go away. A little deeper into the cell, we can see that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is uh, dilated, so this cell is probably taking on water and it's even starting to bow uh, into the cells and compress the cells next to it. Um, there are some significant changes with a sort of loss of the normal glassy appearance to the chromatin that is starting to break up. You may have some, uh, some adherence of chromatin to the sides of the nucleus. The nucleus is no longer round. And this cell does seem like it is still holding on to its uh, basement membrane. Remember that the loss of the desmosomes is one of the last things, but you can tell that this is a pretty sick cell. Let's move into the alveolus. And this is where you start to get a fair amount of clear space on the electron micrograph if it's shot very well because when you're down the alveolus you're trying to focus in on the changes of the alveolar wall or the alveolar septa or the alveolar interstitium whatever you like to uh, call it <clears throat> what we're looking at here is we are looking at several capillaries and then two big alveolar spaces one here one here separated by the alveolar wall okay First thing you should notice on any electron micrograph is these biconcave discs. These are our friends, uh, the erythrocytes, and they always tell us, or almost always tell us, that we are in a capillary. Okay, one capillary, two capillary, three capillaries. We have a big cell here, which is a endothelial cell nucleus. Okay, and then the projections. You don't see this all that often. Usually you just see these little projections, remember? And this gives you a really great idea of how thin the alveolar wall actually is. Okay, there's really nothing to it and that you would expect nothing because you want to uh, be able to diffuse oxygen from the alveolus through tissue into the uh, passing erythrocytes. And if you have really have anything there, uh, it's not going to happen. So if this is the inside of the capillary with this endothelial cell, these biconcave discs. Then we have cells on the outside of the capillary. We have one here and one here. And the one on the outside, it's actually spanning what appears to be two capillaries, but the one on the outside um, with very little cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is so small you can hardly see, and we're going to look at a close-up in a minute, but you can hardly see the cytoplasm, but it does line the entire basement membrane of the capillary. This is your type 1 pneumocyte, okay? Very thin. This is what normally lines the capillaries, and because those cytoplasmic processes are so thin, you can uh, diffuse oxygen through it. There is one other cell here in this micrograph that you should take a look at. And this is a big blocky cuboidal cell on the outside of the capillaries. It doesn't look much like the type 1 pneumocyte because it has all this cytoplasm. And then you have these uh, lamellar bodies within the cytoplasm. This is a type 2 pneumocyte and we know them and it looks very much like it does under the microscope. Okay, they're cuboidal, they're blocky. And these lamellar bodies, which we see within their cytoplasm, are the surfactant. And the surfactant is required um, to be secreted in small amounts to keep the alveoli inflated and not allow the sides of the alveoli 
when it collapses to stick together, you always have a little bit of surfactant so it can pull apart when it inflates. Um, so this is what a type 2 pneumocyte looks like. And, and I want you to think about this because this is very important. You can't diffuse any oxygen through this. So when we have damage to the lung, we have death of the type 1 pneumocytes with their thin processes and replacement by type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia. So they just sort of build a wall here. That part of the lung is done. Now over time, the type 2 pneumocytes can disappear and it can be realigned by by uh, type 1 pneumocytes, it's not a permanent change, but it may be accompanied with by permanent change as a result of inflammation within the interstitium, uh, the, the deposition of fibrin and ultimately collagen, and the wall-making ability of the type 1 pneumocytes. So I think this is a great picture which gives us a lot of insight into the delicate nature of the normal lung. I said that we were going to look at a higher magnification of that type 1 pneumocyte. And here it is. Here's our friend, the erythrocytes. So we know we're in a capillary. Here's a platelet. It's a little bit of a nucleate uh, cellular material which floats around, surrounded by a membrane and a number of granules. Okay. And so here is the basement membrane of the capillary. And here are the processes of the type 1 pneumocyte. They're extremely thin. Here is the nucleus here. You don't see a whole lot of organelles in them. And oftentimes you don't see the nucleus either. This, these are serendipitous pictures, but very important to see the, the, the thin processes of the type 1 pneumocyte in the normal lung. Type 2 pneumocytes, here's uh, several more pictures of type 2 pneumocytes. You can see that uh, um, there are fairly typical epithelial cells. They do have tight junctions. They have microvilli. They don't have a whole lot of organelles, but they're characterized by these lamellar bodies or zebra bodies, um, which have these lamellae of surfactants. And here are some multivesicular bodies. We've looked at those before. Don't confuse those with the surfactant. Those are just phagolysosomes, which have incorporated effete parts of the membrane and are going to break them down. The, the phagosome, which contains a morphosal lysosome, they will be broken down. They will live for the rest of their existence as light perfusing granules within the cytoplasm of the cell. Some cells accumulate lipofusin over time, like neurons, like smooth muscle cells in the intestine, and, and, and cardiocytes. Other cells um, can excrete it. They can extrude it. They can hook it up to microtubules and excrete it from the cell. So there are some long-lived cells which don't have lipofusin, and we're very used to uh, neurons, which are around for our entire lifetime, having lipofusin somewhere around the nucleus. For some reason, it almost always, I don't know why, almost always, if you're looking for lipofusin in normal, healthy cells, you'll find it around the nucleus. And this is just a very nice picture of the extrusion of surfactant. These lamellar bodies, they're pushed out of the cell and then they sort of spread out over the surface of the type 1 pneumocytes to keep that alveolus open. Okay, when you have inflammation in the alveolar wall, here is, and this is tough because we don't, we may right here have an erythrocyte. Um, there are a tremendous number of cells here which make it a little confusing. Here's the alveolar space here, here's the alveolar space, this is the alveolar wall. I hope at this point you can start to identify a few cells and knowing that you are in the lung, you can probably identify these lamellar bodies um, here and in this cell here and possibly here as well and say, you know, I think that those are type 2 pneumocytes. And you would be right. And we are making that wall, which is going to render um, this part of the the alveolus useless um, for transmitting oxygen. So if you know, then in the center of this somewhere, we're going to have to have a capillary, right? 
Uh, we don't have any erythrocytes, but if you look here, we have not covered hematoma uh, lymphatic system yet, but this trilobed nucleus is something that you would probably be able to identify under your microscope with no trouble in the multilobated nucleus of a neutrophil. So this is actually where our, our capillary is. So we have type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia, capillary, and then we have a number of other cells around that capillary. This particular cell is long and thin. I'm not exactly sure what it is. It might be a fibroblast. The other possibility is that remember that uh, um, there are a population of macrophages called alveolar interceptal macrophages, and they live within the alveolar space. They become hypertrophic um, in a number of conditions, including inflammation, uh, various types of bacterial infections, sepsis or whatever. So this may be a uh, intraalveolar macrophage or an intraseptal macrophage right here. And then I get a little confused as to what's going on here. But, but if you picked up that these are those type 2 pneumocytes, and this was the uh, a, a neutrophil, I think you should be patting yourself on the back. This particular picture was taken from that calf who was also administered 3 methylindol This is one of the earlier stages of a prefloric case of interstitial pneumonia. Eventually, this will get worse. You may see a lot of debris in the lumen. Then it gets really confusing. Debris, uh, thick mat of fibrin, uh, which we've looked at. But um, just a nice picture of subacute inflammation of the alveolar wall. Okay, this is uh, this is a, another picture of this is from a rat, and if you told me that this was a type two pneumocyte, I'm going to give you full credit. This one is a little different. This was a type one pneumocyte actually, and we've talked about phospholipidosis in rodents. Phospholipidosis is an acquired uh, lysosomal storage disease which results in the accumulation of phospholipids in a wide variety of cells. Um, and it's usually triggered by certain medications like amiodirone or, or whatever. And, and you will see these whorls of cell membrane and phospholipid um, within lysosomes in a, a wide range, and it's not always, depending on the drug, the same type of cells. You can see them in the liver, you can see them in the kidney, you can see them in the lung, you can see them in, in macrophages. So there are a fair number of really great studies out there, and we're still discovering new drugs that will do this in rodent models. So. Uh, this is sort of a tricky one. I don't think it would be fair for a certification exam because these big cells, and this could be a macrophage as well, um, to me look very much like type 2 pneumocytes. But I've had a couple pictures, and we may encounter one or two more of phospholipidosis in rats because it's really a, a very photogenic disease. Ah, uh, even... Even, even sooner than I thought. Just another picture. I must have been on a phospholipidosis kick when I added these. Oh, this one looks like either Homer Simpson or an alien. Um, but you have these vacuoles full of lamellar bodies that you would see. This is a tough one. I don't think that I could say, hey, this is, these could be club cells. These could be degenerating uh, uh, type 2 pneumocytes, or, I don't see a lot of other things going on. So the, the cell uh, uh, of origin is a bit uh, a, of a mystery here, but really a lovely picture and one more higher magnification of the occlusions in phospholipidosis. This one uh, is in the liver of a rat. So I think we've covered phospholipidosis um, pretty good. I know that this was has been on the uh, ACVP exam back in the day uh, many times and I don't see why it might not pop up again it wouldn't be the full exercise but it might be part of a panel um, with an H&E picture and some other th distractors okay let's move on to the endocrine system 
Um, you don't generally take a whole lot of pictures uh, of uh, with the M in the endocrine system, but there's some really characteristic things in there that you probably should know about. Okay. First thing that I want to do is I want to start with the pancreatic islets. It's one part of the endocrine system that really lends itself nicely to ultra structure. And there is one characteristic. Most of the cells within the pancreatic islet have these dense core granules. Okay, these are cells that are going to stay positive with chromogranin A or, or synaptophysin. And, uh, and your typical dense core granule is exactly what it sounds. It is a membrane bound vacuole or structure, whatever non specific word you could put on it. We just call them granules. And it usually has a very dense black round nucleoid to it. Okay, and this is what we see in most chromaffin cells. Um, these type of granules and so you will see them in a number of uh, different places pancreatic islets adrenal medulla uh, the C cells of the thyroid and so these are very non-specific um, but the beta cells are interesting they're a little different because their granules are somewhat varied and they often have linear granules Okay, so nothing else really looks like that. Okay, you can see here in the inset here, here's one that's linear, here's one that looks like a little check mark, but as you look through some of these cells, you'll see that quite a few of them have like these little rod-shaped granules. So those would be your beta cells here, and then your alpha cells, or maybe it's other cells of the pancreatic islets, the ones that secrete somatostatin or, or uh, pancreatic polypeptide, they'll have your typical round one. So that's sort of a cool one. And if you were to have a islet cell tumor and you wanted to go old school and take it to EM and not just be uh, running the, uh, uh, the, the insulin immunohistochemical marker, this is what you would look like. You'd look for these little rod shaped nucleoids within the granule. If we superimpose a little bit of degeneration on that cell, you'll see a little bit more of the cellular substructure. This islet cell is from a, or this islet is from a diabetic vole. It's sort of tough to tell what cells are what because there are very few granules. I would imagine that these are probably all uh, islet cells. Um, you can see, if you look closely, there are some remnant granules with the uh, linear nucleoids, but the granules are very small. There are so few of them that you can see the tremendous amount of rough endoplasma reticulum that islet cells possess. Remember rough endoplasma reticulum, as we said before, if you're making a lot of protein that's going to be exported from the cell, you'll have rough endoplasma reticulum in abundance. The free ribosomes which float around in the cytosol make protein for the cell. And the interesting part is that, that if you're a ribosome, you can spend part of your life attached to a uh, uh, attached to the endoplasmic reticulum as part of the RER, and then you can pop off and go to another part of the cell and you can make intracellular proteins. So um, sort of degenerate, but the characteristic granules are here, just so few. I hope that you can get to the point of where this animal is diabetic and trying desperately to make insulin. So while we're talking about secretory granules, I guess we can look at a couple of other cells that we would expect. We've already talked about the adrenal medulla and they have these dense core secretory granules, just like we saw in the pancreatic islets. Um, here's a little bit of useless information that I was taught and I've passed on to many people. I don't know if it's ever been put on test or anything like that, but when you get into the adrenal medulla, um, there are two types of cells. They look identically under histology. Some that produce epinephrine and some that produce norepinephrine. Don't even ask me what the difference is. Um, but the epinephrine 
producing cells have centrally placed dense core granules and the norepinephrine secreting cells, theirs are eccentric, so they're not centrally placed. I don't know what difference that makes, but uh, you know, we continue to pass that down like it's some sort of gospel, so now you know. Uh, other cells that are often also chromaffin cells that have dense core granules are the chief cells in the parathyroid gland. And you have to look a little harder. And they're sort of, remember, it's they're, they're sort of scattered through. So what we're looking at here are here are your chief cells here. And you have to look pretty closely. And you see these little clusters of, they don't have the numbers of the dense core granules that the... Uh, uh, that the, the other cell types we've looked at, the, the islet cells and the adrenal medulla do, but you can tell the difference between them and the mitochondria, and they are a little darker. This cell over here is uh, a, a totally different type of cell. It's a cell that you will see occasionally in the thyroid gland. It's called a Herthel cell, and Herthel cells, um, they're scattered throughout the uh, uh, the follicular cells, you can sometimes see uh, tumors composed of these cells, and they're bright pink. And we've talked about pink and purple before. And whenever you see a cell that is bright pink, one of the things that can do that is large numbers of mitochondria. We've also talked about crystalline protein, uh, for example, hyaline droplet disease in rodents, making a cell bright pink. Well, these Herthel cells are bright pink because they have lots and lots of mitochondria. One other thing that will make a, a cell bright pink um, are lysosomes. And over the years, there's been a subgroup of cells which are unrelated. They're in different species called granular cell tumors. And the vast majority of those turn out to be cells with lots and lots of lysosomes in them. But there was a granular cell tumor that uh, was seen in initially in the uh, muscle of the larynx of dogs, and that now is called a, a, a laryngeal rhabdomyoma, um, but it has lots of these mitochondria. So just in case you ever run across a cell in the thyroid with lots of mitochondria, think about earthful cells, also known as oxyphil cells. And we can see oxyphil cells in the thyroid in the salivary gland as well. So not the most impressive uh, dense core granules in the parathyroid chief cells. But remember, these are all cells that also should stain positive for chromogranin A, which is a protein which is used in packaging the secretory granules and synaptophysin as well. So there's all a little bit of relationship here. Okay, while we're in the thyroid, let's talk for a little bit about follicular cells. Okay, if you take a good look at this, first thing that should jump out at you, and if you've seen all the lectures in this series, you'd say, look at all of these secondary lysosomes. They're, they're sort of homogenous with these this dark black material, and normally we would say, yeah, those are secondary lysosomes, um, but this is a little different, and it goes back to uh, it goes back to the processing of thyroid hormones. Okay, so if we look at the cell itself, we see some of the machinery that it uses. Here's a microvilli. This material here, we have a, a section of the colloid. So this is a follicular cell which is surrounding the lumen of a follicle. Here's the colloid. It's just sort of this grainy grayish. We have the, the microvilli here. There's a lot of endoplasmic reticulum, and in certain parts of the cell there's probably a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum, which doesn't particularly show up in this cell all that well. So in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, thyroglobulin is produced. It is packaged, it's addressed and packaged, and it is secreted into the colloid, where it sits until the body needs thyroid hormones. Then under the, uh, the influence of thyroid stimulating hormone, this colloid containing thyroglobulin, the thyroglobulin is absorbed back in small vesicles, and the vesicles will fuse with lysosome-like structures, dumping that colloid into this where it is digested. And the 
iodine, which complexes initially with uh, with tyrosine here in the uh, uh, in the colloid. These iodinated tyrosinases are are digested and they are resecreted. They're they're trafficked. And they're resecreted as the various thyroid hormones. T3, T4, and a couple other thyroid. So what we're looking here is not degenerating parts of the cell membrane, but part of the processing of colloid on its way out of the cells. And these particular uh, structures are very characteristic uh, for uh, thyroid on ultrastructure. Okay, moving on, we're going to revisit an old friend, and this is this crazy mitochondrion from uh, the first lecture. So we're looking at this particular cell, and I think if all we had to look at were these mitochondria, we could probably still get to the, to the part where we are looking at a steroid-producing cell. And everything points to that here. Okay. We talked about the tubulovesicular cristae, which are part of mitochondria and steroid producing cells, those of the adrenal cortex, those of the interstitial cells of the uh, testicle, the Leydig cells of the ovary. And those are the only cell types that have these particular tubulovesicular cristae. But there's a lot of other corroborating evidence in this uh, particular slide as well. Uh, if you look, in between all of these mitochondria are extensive profiles of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is where all the steroid is made. Also in the cytoplasm are large lipid droplets, and lipid is the number one component of steroids. Uh, and when it's oxidized and created into steroids, you do have leftover lipid, which is broken down and either stored or excreted from the cell in these secondary lysosomes right here. So we have everything. And then you can't see it a, a lot of it, but you also have the, the RER, which is required to process protein for extracellular use. So there's everything that points to this as adrenal cortex. Okay, and finally, I'm going to take that last slide and, and superimpose a little bit of damage on it, something that is, is fairly particular. Here are tubulovesicular cristae right here. We have all smooth endoplasm reticulum. I would say adrenal cortex as my number one. There's a little damage here. Some of these profiles are dilated. The cytosol is a little bit uh, lacy and, and loose looking, and we have mild dilation of the nuclear membrane. But the other thing that's going on is that we have all of these structures with this whirling of cell membrane around that. And all of these are damaged organelles. Okay, some might be phagolysosomes, some very well might be mitochondria or whatever. And this is, this is what happens when uh, animals are given uh, cationic amphiphilic compounds, which cause breakdown of uh, the lipid bilayer that surrounds so many organelles. Maybe it's from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. I can't tell, but all the organelles are surrounded by a lipid bilayer. It's also obviously going to do damage to the cell membrane as well. This is a cell that was, at this point, sublethally damaged, maybe on the way out. But I'm sure that around this were a lot of cells that probably weren't even recognizable because the cell membrane was so damaged. Here, the drug has diffused into the cell and is wrecking havoc on the cell membranes of the various organelles. Okay, let's move on to another organ system and let's talk for a little bit about ultrastructure of the nervous system. I like this, it's sort of cool. And uh, you know, like, like all of the other organ systems, form follows function, and this stuff really does make sense. So first, obviously the first cell type that we wanna look at is the neuron. 
Okay, neurons generally a large part of the uh, of the cell is taken up by the nucleus, just like it is a large nuclei on uh, on on glass slides. So we would expect a fairly large nucleus, a prominent nucleus here. There happens to be, and the significance is very difficult to say, but very little heterochromatin, a lot of euchromatin. I think the appearance of the neuron goes, the, the form of the neuron follows the fact that it is a very long-lived structure. You don't get new neurons. They can regenerate to a point, but you have death in the neuron, it's gone. So, so they're expected to last a lifetime. Okay, they tend to have a tremendous amount of free ribosomes and not a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum. The amount of free ribosomes, especially in the area of the nucleus, um, gives it a sort of purplish cast, which some people refer to as nissel substance or nissel body. And remember, you're going to have a tremendous number of ribosomes because this cell has to maintain itself for 75 or 80 years. And so most of the protein that it makes is going to be toward maintaining the various organelles in the membrane, uh, the the synapses, the axon, whatever. Um, so it, it tends to have a balance that's skewed toward free ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Uh, there is some rough endoplasmic reticulum, but you know you don't see a lot of protein excreted from most neurons. Uh, neurotransmitters, yes. So it does have to do that. There's a pretty large Golgi apparatus because these cells are big, so they need something. This is the post office of the cell, so it's going to go in a glycosylate and put addressins on the, the protein so they know where to go in the cell. And the one thing that, uh, that I don't get um, for a cell that supposedly needs oxygen so desperately is the fact that the mitochondria tend to uh, tend to not have a lot of Christy. They they probably I don't know. They don't get a lot of oxygen or something like that. They so these mitochondria are well set to to produce lower amounts of ATP through the process of anaerobic glycolysis. Okay, we are now moving into the uh, neuroparenchyma proper. And what we see are large numbers of unmyelinated axons here. And there is some clear space and it's probably, there's so much artifact whenever you process the nervous system. If you process it uh, in paraffin embedded, you get all sorts of vacuoles and, and artifact and even the best uh, processing of nervous tissue, and I think this is a fantastic picture, you get a lot of, of white space in there. Um, on my particular exam many, many years ago, one of the EMs was uh, nervous, and I was thrown off and I missed it um, because I didn't even recognize it as nervous. Uh, I, I went with my gut feeling that it was something in the lung. So just be forewarned that the processing of nervous tissue can give you a lot of artifactual white space. These, these unmyelinated nerves should actually be cram-packed in there. But So what we're looking at is we're looking at unmyelinated nerves and we're looking at a single Schwann cell which wraps processes around all of these nerves. One particular Schwann cell or oligodendrocyte, uh, depending on where you take the section from, uh, that's what they do. They invest their cell membrane around nerves. Every nerve has to be wrapped by one of these cells and one cell may service 100, 200 or more cells. Okay, these are unmyelinated axons here and they have one layer of the oligo or the Schwann cell cytoplasm wrapped around there. Now, myelination 
is a very similar process except those cells those neuro or those axons have many uh, layers of the cell membrane of the oligodendrocyte or the Schwann cell wrapped around them which allows them to transport uh, signals much faster and what happens it's like if you take a piece of paper and you start to roll and so the swan cell process will start to move in a clockwise or, or anti-clockwise formation so here's the swan cell cytoplasm and it begins to wrap itself and as it wraps itself it does two things you get more and more layers and they're very tightly packed and it also will squeeze this cytoplasm out of that wrapping uh, layers of the Schwann cell cytoplasm. So what you end up with is you end up with nothing but cell membrane on top of the next layer of cell membrane on top of the next layer of cell membrane on top of the next layer of cell membrane. And you end up with just these multiple layers of cell membrane. And the cool part is, and that's what we call compact myelin, and the cool part is, remember, what is the number one component of the cell membrane? It's fat. It's that lipid bilayer. When you squeeze out all the cytoplasm, you probably have about 90 to 95% fat. And luckily for us, fat is, it picks up osmium tetroxide very easily. So a myelinated axon is going to have a very dense black thick wrapping around it here is your your schwann cell here and it's wrapped itself around this axon again and again and again and again and if you look at this inset you'll see how many layers are on this myelinated axon okay so these are on myelinated they have one wrap around them and these are myelinated and they have multiple wrappings around them so basically they're just surrounded by a lot of fat okay uh, I don't know if you've ever considered this but our brains are probably 90 percent fat so if someone calls you a fathead you thank them because it means that you're healthy um, just this is something that would never be on a uh, uh, on an exam uh, or hopefully not one I would ever take but uh, I think it's cool and this is a very complicated picture but what we're looking at are multiple unmyelinated axons and one myelinated axon okay and remember that that the conduction of a nerve impulse down a myelinated axon really doesn't just go straight it jumps and it jumps from what's known as the node of Ranvier to the next node of Ranvier to the next node of Ranvier. It's a much faster way that this occurs. And so somebody who obviously had a lot of time on their hands took a picture of myelinated axons and the node of Ranvier. And you can see the myelin here and here coming down to a spot where there is none. And this probably marks the limit of the reach of one of the oligodendrocytes or one of the Schwann cells in wrapping. They can only go so far. And then you have this little place where the, the axon did not get wrapped and then the next oligo takes over here. So I think it's a great picture and, uh, and I hope you enjoy it as well. Uh, another picture from the brain this is an oligodendrocyte the reason you can tell the difference is because this one has an O all the rest had an S which means that you know without knowing exactly where these are taken from you could be in a peripheral nervous system you could be in the central nervous system it's really difficult to tell you know you don't want to overinterpret. hopefully so here's a big neuron right here and then you can see all of the unmyelinated axons that are serviced by this oligodendrocyte and a couple of small myelinated axons. So now you know the difference between myelinated and unmyelinated and one of the big problems that you see with with myelinated axons is that you can have a problem with the myelin. 
Okay, we have a lot of diseases that you get demyelination, you get damage to myelin, you get intramyelinic edema with certain toxins. And so that will show up very nicely on the on an EM in the form of these plexiform splits within the myelin. Okay, should be one nice uninterrupted bit of myelin right here, and that's a good one. And then you see all of these places where it's starting to split. You have accumulation of fluid uh, within it. This one happens to be a, uh, uh, a Siamese kitten with one of the lysosomal storage diseases that is affecting uh, the oligodendroglia. And you can see that all of the myelinated axons, the myelin is degenerating. If you if you kill off the oligo or you injure the oligo or Schwann cell, all of those cells that it is myelinating are going to have myelination problems because that's something that has to be constantly maintained. So you can do damage to uh, myelin directly with certain toxins like uh, bromethylene in toxicosis, which is a fairly commonly used uh, rodenticide, which uh, in tends to cause intramyelinic edema and splitting of these myelin lamella, and then you have obvious uh, neurologic problems. This is another lysosomal storage disease. This is a fel feline mucolipidosis, just to show you the tremendous damage that some of these diseases will do to myelin. And then I'm just going to th throw one more uh, cell type at you from the nervous system, and you're looking at me saying, "Hey, we just covered this. This was the this is the respiratory system. Are you crazy?" But remember that you have uh, every cell in the body of any type has at least one cilium, but you have ciliated cells in a number of spots, and this is a cuboidal epithelial cell ciliated from the ependema, and the ependema uses the cilia to, to help with the movement of cerebrospinal fluid. So you'll see this in the ependema. We're going to look at it in uh, uh, another uh, system coming right up. But there are places in the body where you have cilia. You have them in the inner ear. Uh, you can have them in the area of the choroid plexus. Another place that you will see cilia as we, we segue almost imperceptibly uh, into the reproductive system is in sperm. Okay, sperm is basically, I love these pictures because sperm is basically a little bit of DNA payload here. This is the acrosomal cap. This is, uh, and it, it contains, the cap contains hyaluronidase, which will allow it to dissolve the zona pellucida and inject the, the DNA material here. Okay, and then the rest of the entire thing is nothing but a big cilium. If you do a cross section down the middle of a sperm, the tail has a very characteristic nine doublets and two singlets arrangement that we recognize as a classic cilia, which goes all the way down to primitive protozoa. They're all made the same, at least on this planet they are. And the only other thing that's really of note is look at all the mitochondria. Remember form follows function and all of the activity in this particular cell is that cilia waving madly, trying to move forward and beat out 100 billion other sperm uh, to get to the egg and fertilize it. So that's where you put all your mitochondria and that's pretty much it for sperm. Okay, not a lot of organelles, very short-lived cells. So it's all about the cilia. I don't have a lot to say about the reproductive system when it comes to ultrastructure because um, I know that if you're working in pharma, you probably do it. I've not had uh, any opportunity, I think, in all of my years to take any reproductive tissue to EM. Um, this would be just the most miserable thing for somebody to do, put this on an exam. But if you wondered what a testicular tubule uh, shot uh, under EM would look like, 
This is what it would look like. We're looking at the edge of a tubule right here with a basement membrane and lined up along that, occasionally uh, forming sort of this pyramidal structure or the Sertoli cells. And then everything else are spermatogonia in various stages of development. And here is a fully functional, well, it's not fully functional, it's a almost developed spermatid, which is developing the acrosomal cap and a, a probably a cilium right here. I think this is one of those things that if you have a very good protocol and you're looking at this on a regular basis, there are probably some really smart people out there that can figure all this stuff out. It's not for me. Um, but these are interstitial cells. They have a lot of lipid. If we got close, which we don't, I wish we had a little closer picture, but if we got close, we would see the tubulo vesic uh, tubulo vesicular Christi that uh, are character that characterize steroid producing. We have uh, we have all of our lipid here. We probably, if we looked around, some of these are going to be uh, secondary lysosomes with some residual degenerate lipid in them because this particular cell is mobilizing the lipid, turning it into sterols, and secreting it. And we're going to mercifully stop with the reproductive system at this point. We're going to stop this lecture at 15 minutes, and we're going to have one more where we're going to cover some very interesting systems. We're going to cover the musculoskeletal, both cardiovascular and skeletal muscle, a little bit of smooth muscle. We want to do the hematolymphatic. Um, and I think that'll cover the where am I part of this lecture series. So I hope uh, you learned a couple things here. Um, and I hope that they stick with you. I hope you come back for some of the other lectures. Until then, I wish you good health, good luck, and a good life, and I'll see you again.